Thank you for this very generous introduction. And thanks to you all for coming to my class <laughs> in the afternoon. Um, I'm not a politician, just, I think it's, it's boring to be a thing to a politician. It's, I think it's more interesting to be a political commentator and criticize the politicians all the time. Um, my talk is titled Myths and Facts, but I, as, since the talk is shorter than what I thought, I will just give into one myth and deal with some facts. And I think the myth is that, the myth that I'll criticize is that Islam is inherently incompatible with democracy. That's an idea that, you know, some people think is true. Uh, that's an idea that guides some policies today. And that's an idea that has some credibility. I mean, when you look at some Islamic actors in the Middle East today, yes, they don't sound very democratic. They don't act democratic. So there are reasons to maybe believe in that idea that Islam is, compatible, is, is incompatible with democracy. But as someone coming from a Turkish background, someone who has seen how Islam and democracy has played out in the history of Turkey, I think that's a wrong way of looking at politics and, and, and religion. And let me try to explain why, and I would love later to get your questions and your objections and comments if you want. Well, if we, first of all, whenever we want to speak about Middle East and Islam, I think we should do, always do a little bit of history and remind ourselves that the part of the world that we call the Middle East just a century ago was actually called the Ottoman Empire. I mean, the Middle East is a term created by the British. You know, they look at the world, this is, this is the Middle East, this is the Far East, according to how they see the world, and you know, they made a good job, no problem with that. But it was, it was not called the Middle East before because it was just actually one state, Ottoman Empire. It was based where, on, in where I live, Istanbul, and you know, the Ottomans had a big map stretching from Vienna to uh, Yemen. Uh, and they gradually lost the Balkan, territory, the Balkan territories, but the Middle East, all, almost all Arab states that exist right now were a part of the Ottoman Empire. And of course, the Ottoman Empire collapsed in World War I, and that's how the modern Middle East came to be, from modern Turkey to Saudi Arabia, two extremes, uh, from Morocco, well, Morocco was not an empire, like from Algeria to Yemen, all these states emerged from the ashes of the Ottoman Empire. But when people start to speak about democracy, they always begin with this modern era, the end of the Ottoman Empire and what emerged after that. However, as I show in my book, Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty, the Ottoman Empire had a very important and interesting modernization era, which also had a democratization element in itself. This era, called Tanzimat in Turkish, which means reorganization, began in 1839 when the Ottoman Sultan issued an edict which basically established rights of the citizens, limited the powers of the Sultan, and which soon even made the non-Muslims of the empire, Jews and Christians, equal citizens of the empire. Now that's an important issue because you know what? In classical Islamic law, Jews and Christians are given right to practice their religion, they're called dhimmis, that means protected, but they're not equal. They don't have the equal legal setting, which was, in a medieval era, actually comparable to, <laughs> that was actually preferable to what you would have in medieval Christendom. That's why Jews, when they were persecuted in Catholic Spain, they were forced to convert, they had come to the Ottoman Empire because the Ottoman Empire had regarded them as protected people, and that's why Jews have a very, actually, positive history in the whole Ottoman Empire. Uh, but it was not equal citizenship. So the Ottomans made Jews and Christians in 1856 with, the, with another edict called uh, Islahat Farmani in Turkish, the Islahat Edict or Reform Edict, made them equal citizens of the empire. Secondly, the Ottoman Empire initiated a democratic process which ultimately culminated in, the, in a constitution in 1876. And a constitution was, of course, combined with a elections and parliament. So in 18, as early as 1876, you had an elected parliament, one third of which were Ottoman Armenians, Jews, or Christians. Uh, actually, the fez, you know, the red cano canonical hat, 
was a symbol of this Ottoman modernization because before that era, in the Ottoman Empire, if you were a Muslim, you would wear a particular turban. If you're a Jew, you would wear something else. If you're a Christian, you would wear something else. So your hat, the, the, the thing you put on your head, symbolized your identity. But in the Tanzimat era, the Sultan said, now let all Ottomans wear the fez as a symbol of equality, equal citizenship, that all Ottomans are now the same. That's why in late Ottoman Empire, in the bureaucracy, you had, again, Jewish or Armenian or, or Greek uh, members, like uh, prominent ministers or like ambassadors or in, in, in foreign ministry. Uh, and of course, there were other reforms like school, schools were uh, opened for uh, women, slavery was, uh, slave trade was at least banned. And by the way, that's interesting because when Ottomans were doing these reforms, some fundamentalists did not like these reforms, and some of them were based in the Arabian Peninsula, and uh, pa particularly the Wahhabi school of thought considered Ottomans as heretics because first they were engaged in Sufism, which the Wahhabis thought is too, uh, too mystical and too wishy-washy you know, from their point of view, a very strong jurisprudence point of view. Secondly, they thought the Ottomans were changing Islamic law and actually, that's why in 1856, there was a revolt against the Ottomans by a Wahhabi cleric named Abdul Muttalib. He's, he said, Turks have gone infidels by changing Islamic law. Like what? By banning slave trade. Well, he was making profits from slave trade, of course. That was one uh, reason that he actually felt that way. But that dynamic was already there. So change within Islam, and some people were reacting to that, was even there in the 19th century. And the difference between, for example, the Turkish and the Wahhabi tradition, which you also see today as Salafism, was already there in the 19th century. Well, the big difference was that the Ottoman version or understanding of Islam was the dominant view, whereas the Wahhabi view was just then a backwater, uh, was seen as like retrogates in the, in the middle of nowhere. In the 20th century, things would change, and you know, with oil money, the, uh, the Salafi Wahhabi view would become more dominant in the 20th century, and that's a different story. But what happened when, yeah, so one thing to say, democracy has some roots, and had the Ottoman process went on, probably we would be seeing the evolution of a democratic Middle East, uh, because in late Ottoman Empire, there were already political parties competing with each other. In 1910, when the Ottoman parliament reconvened again after Sultan Abdul Hamid's you know, era of like an undemocratic rule, you had a party of Ahrar, which means liberals. You had a party of Union and Progress. You had the party of uh, Hurriyet ve Itlaf, which means freedom and, uh, and separation. So you had all these political parties competing with each other. However, the empire fell because of basically ethnic conflicts. One tragic result was the, the ethnic cleansing of Ottoman Armenians, which is a very tragic story, but I think we should, Turks should empathize more. Uh, but anyway, the modern Middle East emerged uh, after that. However, there was one curse for this Middle East, for this modern uh, Muslim Middle East. And the curse was that the ideas that were coming to the new Middle East of the 20s from Europe were not necessarily liberal or democratic ideas. Because when we speak of the modern West, Democracy, liberalism, liberal democracy are not the only things that emerged uh, in the modern West. Quite the contrary, in the 20s and 30s, the idea of a powerful state, one party state, with one strong leader was the Western norm. Well, England and of course US were exceptions, but it's especially in continental Europe, that idea was there. And unfortunately, most of the emerging republics in the Middle East, took not a democracy, but this authoritarian state, modern state, as their ideal. And that's why all across the region, you had either absolute monarchies, which of course did not change much, but you had these new republics, which had zero democracy, like the Nasser of Egypt, like the Ba'ath republics in Iraq and Syria. Even in Turkey, I should say, Turkey became a republic in 1923, but it, just in two years, in 1925, Turkey became a single party republic in which all opposition was banned and only one vision of modernity was imposed. Uh, however, Turkey was lucky, and thanks to the Ottoman heritage, and thanks to the pragmatism of Turkish single party leadership, 
Turkey was able to have a transition to multi-party politics as early as 1950. Uh, in other words, in 1950, Turkey had its spring begin. So if, if, you had, if you Turks are luckier than Arabs on one thing, but there may be different reasons, but we had our spring beginning 60 years ago. Uh, and that allowed the Islamic pious in Turkey, called them Islamists or conservatives, to be engaged in the political system, compete with other forces, and learn what, how democracy functions and become more pragmatic. Whereas what happened in most other countries in the region is that secular modernist uh, dictatorships never gave room for any democracy. And the Islamists that were often suppressed by these dictatorships grew more and more radical and violent. So we had this vicious cycle of secular regimes oppressing Islamists and Islamists becoming violent and extremist and using sometimes armed jihad against the dictators and even sometimes, unfortunately, against uh, Western powers as well. Let me give you an actually clear example of that, a very stark, starking example of that. In 1925, Iran was, there was a revolution in Iran and the Shah came to power. He overthrew the Qajar dynasty, which was ruling Iran for a long time. So Shah was a modernist. Uh, and, you know, modernist sounds good maybe, right? And, well, he was not a liberal modernist. He was an authoritarian modernist. So he said, we want to liberate our women in Iran. And what he did, he said he passed a new law which banned the headscarf, the whale, even on the street. So soon, in late 1920s, Iranian police began attacking women and tearing their whale off because it became illegal. Of course, well, this was progress in, for, in the eyes of some people. And I think there are some people who in, in Europe who think similar terms about banning burqa and so on these days. I, I disagree with them. But of course, this was an attack on faith and tradition in the eyes of other people. That's why the Ayatollahs of Iran, which has been always a strong class, condemned the Shah. They called him Yazid, you know, the uh, infidel, you know, the enemy of God, enemy of religion, and so on. And soon Shah got the Ayatollahs whipped, executed. There were some clashes in mosques and so on. And the first terrorist movement of the 20th century, the first Islamically inspired, or the first Islamic or Muslim terrorist movement of the 20th century called Fedayani Islam, which means devotees of Islam, emerged in Iran to take revenge from the Shah by assassinating Shah's men. So the what was understood as an attack on Islam had created a reactionary movement which led to terrorism. And unfortunately, this vicious cycle between the Shah and the Islamists would be uh, repeated again under the second Shah, and which would come back, ultimately, the revenge would come back as Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, and when Ayatollah Khomeini got power, did he establish a democratic Iran? No. Well, he just changed things upside down. He said, now women will put the headscarf on. Now, or everything was just an a, a oppressive secular government was replaced with now a theocratic government, which I have to put the mullahs had the upper hand. The problem was that Iran never created a middle ground in which political parties could compete with each other, including the Islamists, and they could, you know, come to a consensus and learn from each other. So one which is one dictatorship was replaced by another one. Now we would have been very unlucky if the same thing happened in Turkey, if the same thing happened in Egypt, if the same thing happened in Tunisia. Because when Mubarak was overthrown, I mean, there could have been a Islamist revolution. Well, we, we, we will see what happens to Egypt. But my hope is that countries like Egypt and Tunisia will follow not the Iranian model, in which a secular oppressive government, which was, which were like, may be hailed in the West as moderate or progressive or secular, but not democratic or liberal by any means. Uh, if these are replaced by Islamist dictatorships, you know, nothing will change in the Middle East. It will get better or worse from where you're looking at, but it will not be democratic or liberal. What you need is, like in Turkey, you need a democratic system in which all groups in society, from secularists to atheists to uh, Muslim conservatives to the very hardcore uh, Islamists participate and basically try to achieve political power 
through persuasion, through appealing to the, through, through the ballots. But once you get into that line, you start to change. Turkey's so-called Islamists, for example, which are in power in 10 years, I mean, in 2002, like Erdogan and uh, you know, AKP. Do. And I know he's not very popular in Israel, and I understand the reasons, and I respect the reasons. But ultimately, that's a political party which has been successful through the ballots. And by focusing on the economy, by making Turkey a more prosperous country, boosting uh, infrastructure, boosting Turkish economy in general, and making life better in Turkey, not through a, like a uh, military coup or not any demo, like a dictator, dictatorial politics. Uh, and also in Turkey, over the years, we have seen thinkers like in the late Ottoman Empire, who basically say, well, democracy and Islam are co compatible from a theoretical point of view as well, because, well, they have ideas. I mean, God gave every individual a reason, and democracy is the articulation of reason. Everybody can participate. There is no theocratic authority in Islam who can speak on behalf of God. Every believer has a conscience. So these ideas are there, for example, in Turkey. And if there is a ground for these ideas to flourish, we see them, you know, they make sense to many believers. That's why I think, if you look at it from a theoretical point of view, which I try to do also as a, as a, in my book, Islam in Our Extremes, there are arguments within Islam, as there are arguments within Christianity and Judaism, for articulating a vision of democracy, a plural society. Uh, but as we have seen, there are also dictatorial interpretations of Islam, like in Iran, uh, like, uh, I mean, I'm not even mentioning the Al-Qaeda vision, which is totally violent and extremist and doesn't even have a political vision, it's just simply murder and violence uh, that we should fully condemn. So, however, these, these things all coexist. So Islam can be understood in many different ways. And why is it understood this way or that way? That depends on many factors from the religious background that we're speaking about? Is it a Salafi background? Is it a more, uh, oh, is it a background which is, is, or is it an interpretation of Islam which is more open to interpretation? That's something to begin with. Secondly, the political context and the political histories of these countries we're speaking about also are very important. Uh, that's why I think today, policymakers in the West or in the Middle East would be making a mistake if they say categorically Islam and democracy are incompatible. That's why, for the sake of democracy, Islamists should be suppressed, which is actually a contradiction in terms of, I mean, if you speak in a democracy, it should be based on inclusion, but if you exclude some people, how can you expect them to be actually a part of the game? And uh, I think, unless they engage in violence, of course, which can never be accepted, Islamists, even the most close-minded ones, should be included in the game. And of course, we will test this hypothesis in Egypt, in Tunisia, and elsewhere. And I think so far, it's been just a, a little more than a year in the Arab Spring. I think so, the signs are not that disappointing, especially in Tunisia, for example. The Islamists of Tunisia, uh, led by Nahda, the party of Renaissance, they're called, are willing to be you know, legitimate actors in democracy and focusing on economic progress and not imposing their way of life on other citizens. Uh, it will take time, of course, for all these countries. It took Turkish Islam a lot of time to change their opinions, but it happened at the end. Uh, that's why I think if uh, democracy and freedom is taken as ground and people are welcome to the system, I hope we will see more and more democracies emerging in the Middle East, democracies which will allow the most Islamic pious, the most conservative, to be a part of those societies as the secularists of those societies are. And finally, as I said yesterday, maybe Israel can be taken as a model by some Muslims in the sense that Israel is a society in which the very orthodox, moderately orthodox, and the seculars, they're all, they all exist and compete with each other and they have disagreements on how to organize a society, but ultimately it works within democracy. And I think that's possible for Islam and for Islamic societies as well. Thank you so much. I think we have a little time left, and I would love to use that for question and answers. Yes, sir. Uh, I think there's a microphone. I will. Not a problem. The question is a deep question that I'm about to ask you. Uh, about probably about 20 months ago, I was in a conference at Hebrew University in the Truman Center. 
uh, that goes back to Harry Truman 11 month, uh, minutes after the State of Israel, the United States was there. And the third day of the conference, the last panel, a man by the name of Saib Arakat, was on that panel. Who was and on the panel, sorry? Saib Arakat, he's a chief negotiator. Yes, that's right. He was the chief negotiator, of the, he is the chief negotiator. He's been around since about 1967, as far as the Palestinians are concerned. What he said was, and I'm looking because I see myths and facts, and I thought that maybe I'd come in and be able to hear different types of things that were going on. Um, basically, what he said to the group, not realizing that it was the press person in the room, yet at the same time, the GPO invited us. Um, he said, in trying to get a reaction from the students of Hebrew University, I lie, so what? I lie. Now, there's a, a thought process in the in the Muslim world that if you have a pony, if you if have you, a donkey, you know what I'm about to say. Okay, no. Then, oh, if you have a pony or you have a donkey, then basically you're a friar if you don't call him a horse. Now my question to you basically is, with that, how do we then, in using the myths, the facts, the thought process of somebody that knows from the inside, how do we take steps towards making a great world, a world of real peace, a world where we can trust each other and take steps forward with the world of Islam. If this is the thought process that's coming out, and I mean it from a very positive perspective, I'm looking at it from a perspective from your wisdom of what you know in dealing with myths and facts of trying to bring it forward and make this world a better place to be for all of us. Thank you so much. Well, I don't know that well about the donkey you know, <laughs> example much. But how we can move forward? Uh, first of all, one thing. In this great civilizational divide, as I call like the Muslim world versus the West, I've noted that people always hear the craziest voice on the other side, to be frank. Like, in the United States especially, or in the Western media, the mostly frequently quoted imams are the people who are, say, kill everybody, like in Jews and that kind of very fanatic people. They make the news. And let me tell you, it is the same thing on our side. The people that are often quoted in the Middle Eastern media about Islam in the West are these days like gentlemen called Geert Wilders in, in Holland who says like all Muslims should be thrown out of Europe and Islam is like fascism and so on. Uh, the most frequently quoted pastor in the Turkish media, US American religious leader was this gentleman who wanted to burn the Quran in Florida. And I mean, maybe it's his constitutional right, but I know it was not a mainstream view in the United States, but he made the news. So that was quoted as Christians are now burning our scripture. Christians, including this particular, you know, angry gentleman in Florida who doesn't really represent much. So we have that, so that's why we should engage and talk to each other. And we have people among us in both civilizations that don't talk to them. It's useless. We know that they're evil. We know that they are all want to destroy us. Those people in our own side are, I think, blocking our own vision. That's why, like, when I talk to audiences in Turkey, I'm, I'm trying to say, they're not as bad as you think. <laughs> you should talk to them. And when I'm talking to Western audiences, I'm like trying to say, same thing. They're not as bad as you think, and they're actually nuances, and you should try to talk to the people on the other side, which is more nuanced. I think that's what we need. Yes, sir. Takia? Oh, Takia. Okay. Well, the idea, I think, another, again, the, the idea of a Takia is that, especially it's strong in the Shiite tradition, so the idea is that you should lie. Uh, if you're in need, if you're in danger, or for a political purpose, or if, if, if you have a purpose that's beneficial for religion, you can lie and hide your intentions. Well, I don't, I think nobody has to even have a religious principle to do that. I mean, hypocrisy is a universal problem, and people are, can be hypocritical, and especially modern states, most of them, maybe all of them are hypocritical to some extent. So, do we have some hypocritical people in the Muslim world? Yes. Do we have some hypocritical people in the West? I don't know. I mean, maybe you can, you can, you would know that. I mean, it doesn't mean that, though, every sentence coming from the Muslim world should be taken as takia. I mean, some people lie, some people tell the truth, some people are honest. It's a, and I should just say that the idea of a takia is stronger in the Shiite tradition than in the Sunnis, and for the historical reasons that Shiites generally have been oppressed and 
being marginalized, so they had to hide their identity and so on. And let me tell you one thing. We have anti-Semites in Turkey, anti-Semites, who read the Talmud and found some suggestions among medieval Jews about hiding their intentions and so on, and which probably has a historical context and understanding. So look, extrapolating from that and never trust the other side making that argument would be, I think, a mistake. Um, oh, sorry. I... Oh, you got it. Okay. So. Um... I've spent bits of time in Turkey in the last few years and, and generally have just really loved it and been incredibly impressed by it and have been, as somebody who's originally European, very sad actually at the way that the EU has related to Turkey. I know and, things. And, and just have felt that Turkey has borne the possibility of, of really being a democratic state and a Muslim society and of finding that line. And it's hard as a non-Turk and a non-expert to kind of follow the nuances of what's happened in the last year or two. It seems really clear that the government has wanted both to reach out towards the Arab world and to push away Israel and the Jewish community to some extent. And, and, and one can at one level see places that, that, that potentially make sense from a Turkish perspective. I'm just interested to have you comment on that and what you see happening and potentially how Israel and the Jewish community should relate towards that and, and where the Jewish community and Israel should be able to understand what Turkey is doing and where it should try and push back and engage. Mm -hmm. What's happening in Turkey under the current government, especially, I mean, in the ten, yeah, past 10 years? That, but also in terms of, of, of what you're talking about, of the possibility okay. of being, the possibility of being at one and the same time, as it were, Turkish, democratic, <coughs> Muslim, and part of the Middle East, and how those pieces fit together. Okay, sure. Uh, I have a chapter on this in my book, so just to, just to mention, uh, it's a good read. But shortly, I'm cautiously optimistic about things, the political change in Turkey. I'm cautious because, you know, we Turks have a tendency to go radical, I mean, in the sense that, like, irrational sometimes and, you know, get into irrational political wars and debates. But I think over the past 10 years, what has happened in Turkey that, yes, a more conservative-minded government is ruling Turkey, but this more conservative-minded government has also done more pro-EU efforts and EU-related reforms than anybody else. And they are actually struggling to make a sense with their tradition and the norms of liberal democracy, and they have not been doing too bad. There's, there are points here and there. Erdogan is too tough on his line, and he's too tough on Israel. He's too tough on everybody, including domestic opposition and sometimes in Shimon Peres and so on. But that's, that's a style. But I should say, AKP, one thing that AKP has done in Turkey, the current government, they have been able to channel the Islamic energy in Turkey into pragmatic politics. Pragmatic politics, that's fine, and actually wants to be a member of the EU. Pragmatic politics that focuses on economic investment, and, and, and Turkey has become a very economic-minded country, like a trading state. Uh, and while we have members of the Turkish Jewish community, I'm sure they will be more authoritative than me on this, but I think the Turkish government has also made progress in terms of minority rights in Turkey. For example, Turkish Jews had recently received some of their foundations that were confiscated in the 1920s out of nationalist considerations back. And, uh, and unfortunately, we have some anti-Semites in Turkey, but I don't think that Turkish government is driven by their ideology. Uh, the, the issues with Israel is something different, and you know, Turkey's own Jewish community is different. Uh, and I hope that Turkey is becoming a more free and democratic society, although we still have a lot of issues to solve. Should we go? Yeah, I'm sorry. So I'm being warned that I have to, like, yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you.